All right, sub-basing characteristics. So you've gone through the steps of loading in your GIS data sets, right? So you have shape files, you have your terrain data. You've gone through the process of delineating sub-basins, defining reaches, so you have all of that geospatial information. The next step that you can run is sub-basin characteristics. It's an option from the parameters menu. And whenever you run that tool, you're going to see a table that looks like this. And what you notice in this table for each sub-basin in the basin model, there's these physical characteristics that the program computes for you. And so you have things like the longest flow path length for a sub-basin, the longest flow path slope, centroidal flow path, and so on. So I'm going to ask a question. If you want to put it in the chat or come off mute, fantastic. Um, but based on your experience in hydrologic modeling, why are these sub-basin characteristics important? Matthew, by, by my experience, the format of the, the contour of the sub-basin, it defines the main properties of the peak flow. So we can reach p uh, bigger peakers, bigger peaks, and wider ones, depending on how the, the, the sub-basin is defined. This is a big question exactly. for whenever you have to, to define the sm smallest or biggest or bigger uh, sub-basin, since you can, this effect can be uh, can be shared with all, all the, the, the other watersheds, the neighboring Perfect. watersheds. You're right, Lincoln. Thank you for sharing. Um, so exactly. So these sub-basin characteristics help define how water is going to move across the watershed, right? So let's just pick some of these here. So longest flow path length. And these are in miles, so English units, um, but you can translate it to kilometers here. For this sub-basin right here, the longest flow path length is 22 miles. For this one right here, it's around 15 miles. Right, so if you had rainfall falling on both sub-basins, the type of information that this provides me is, well, water's gonna run off the East Branch Mahoning Creek, this first sub-basin, more quickly than this, the third sub-basin because it has a less length to travel on, right? Another thing to look at is slope. Wow, so this sub-basin, it's really going to travel much faster, right? The slope for this first sub-basin along the longest flow path length is steeper than the, the third sub-basin. So these characteristics, just like Lincoln was sharing with us, is it helps us identify HMS model parameters. And that's what we're going to transition into next is these characteristics, these physical characteristics, can be used with our calculator our parameter calculator. Let's see if I can find it. it. Might be at the bottom. There we go. The parameter expression calculator. Let me get the right terminology here. So this is a very handy tool. In the, in the past, you would have to do this in a GIS, and you'd have to go through tons of steps to get these initial parameter estimates from the GIS data. Now you can stay directly within HMS and open up what we call the parameter expression calculator. What you should have heard through the, the tutorials is you can use gridded data, right? So if you have grids of your soil type, which you've translated to a saturated hydraulic conductivity or some kind of storage in the soil, and you've loaded those data sets as rasters into your HMS project, then this expression calculator is going to process that information and then compute the average sub-basin parameter for you. Right, And the, the slide that we have here, we're using this expression calculator and a grid of the percolation rate or the saturated hydraulic conductivity, and we're going to compute the average value for each of my sub-basins. All right, you can use your gridded data. You can also use those, um, let's see here, where's a nice figure? There we go. You can also use those physical characteristics. Right, those sub-basin characteristics that we were just talking about, well, you can string those together in a formula to help you estimate the time of concentration. 
or other parameters in your, your um, HMS model. So one thing I want to point out early on here is the formula that you saw in the workshop today or this past week, that formula or that regression equation that was used to estimate the time of concentration, it really only applies to a specific region, a specific watershed, right? So some, what somebody did at some point in time is they took all of these physical characteristics and they took some kind of calibrated model that determined the time of concentration for specific watersheds and then they did a regression analysis. And that regression analysis is what generated that equation that was used in the workshop. If you have a watershed and you need to populate the time of concentration, then hopefully you have an opportunity to use observed data in the region to help you develop some kind of relationship between time of concentration and the physical characteristics in your watershed. So it's very watershed dependent, okay? So I'll pause there and see if there's any questions so far. Okay, so real quick, let's go through some of the characteristics that are generated. Let's talk about, let me go up here. That's base and relief. I want to talk about, there we go, longest flow path and the longest flow path slope. So the longest flow path, think of that as if you dropped water on the watershed, what is the longest flow path that a drop of water has to take to reach the subbasin outlet. And in this example, so this, in this simple graphic, this is would be the longest length that water had to travel to reach the subbasin outlet right here. And based on the terrain data that's defined for this basin model, we can find the elevation at the most upstream point, and we can find the elevation at the most downstream point, and then based on that length, we can compute the slope for the watershed, or for that travel length, sorry. So that's the longest flow path slope that you see here. There's also what we call the 1085 flow path length and the 1085 flow path slope. So what that means is along this flow path, and I probably won't say it exactly right the very first time here, but let's say we, we choose a point that's at 10% along this flow path and then 85% along the flow path. So we're not taking the entire length. We're taking, we're starting at 10% and we're ending at 85%, right? And so if we do that in this example, so let me go to the right side. So maybe this is at 10% where my mouse is right here. Let me just draw on the slide. Let's see here. So that point's gonna be at 10% of the length. Let's say this is at, oops. and then this is at, this is at 85, right? And if you pick those points and then compute the slope of the 1085, what you should get from this is that slope should be smaller, not steeper, smaller, flatter, than if you use the entire flow path length. All right, so that question was in the, the lecture section and also in the workshop, workshop section. And it's wrong in the workshop section. We'll go over it in just a minute. But ideally, in most situations, the slope along the longest flow path is going to be steeper than the slope along the 1085 flow path. Okay. So some regression equations use longest flow path, other regression equations use the 1085 flow path and slope. Um, other characteristics for, that we have, basin slope, there's a nice slide here that helps us come up with basin slope. That's the slope of every grid cell to the next grid cell where water flows average across the, the sub-basin. So that's how the basin slope is computed. So think of it as an average slope from all the grid cells in that sub-basin. Basin relief, let's see here. It represents the elevation difference between the highest point on the drainage divide and the outlet of the subbasin. 
that's pretty clear. Relief ratio, let's see what that means. The relief ratio is simply the base and relief, so the elevation difference between the highest point and the lowest point along the longest flow path, and then the length of the longest flow path. And elongation ratio. This one's interesting. I've never used this one before in any of the regression equations. Um, but you can see what it means, right? So a regression or elongation ratio, um, the values range from 0.2 to 1. Lower values mean the subbasin is, let's see here, more elongated, right? Skinnier, spread out in space versus those uh, values closer to one, you have a circular subbasin. And what could that help you, I guess, determine? So to me, when I think of this, for your time of concentration or how water moves across the watershed, so for elongation ratios that are smaller, so those that represent this subbasin right here, it should take longer for water to reach the outlet. It has a longer distance to travel versus these subbasins that are more circular in size, right? Water is going to move across those more quickly because the travel length is going to be a bit shorter on average for that watershed. And then finally, the last one here, let's see here, let's learn more about drainage density. Uh, yeah, I've never used this one either in regression equations, but what it does, it's a, a measure of how many stream segments are going to be in your your basin model and you could identify those with more stream segments probably are more efficient in routing water off the watershed versus those watersheds that have fewer stream segments so that's that's one way to think about it oh i see the question out there may the elongation ratio be greater than one let's go back here let's see So a diame diameter of a circle with the same area as the subbasin divided by the length of the longest flow path. I'm not sure I'd have to dig into it a little bit more to see if it could be greater than one. Um, but the take home for today, the larger the elongation ratio, the more close it is to a circle. I'm guessing, no, it cannot be greater than one is a perfect circular watershed. Closer to zero means you have a long, skinny subbasin. All right, so those are the subbasin characteristics. Let's jump down to reach characteristics too. Um, there's not as many, but you have a few. And these are fantastic for your reach routing parameters. And you'll learn, learn this later in the class. Um, for some of the reach routing methods, you do need the length and slope of the channel. Mm -hmm. And the great news is HMS can compute that directly for you. Right, so the first two columns here, we have length. We have slope for each of those stream segments. Relief, I'm guessing that's just like what um, the subbasin relief was. It's the elevation of the upstream end of the reach minus the elevation at the downstream end of the reach. And then sinuosity, let's take a look at sinuosity here. That's relief, sinuosity. So reach sinuosity is generally defined as the ratio of the actual stream length to the valley length. Okay, let's see what that really means. So the reach length right here divided by the straight line length. And this is a really good graphic right here. Right, so we have the straight line length from this point to that point, so we can compute that in the GIS. And then we also have the actual length of the, the stream segment too. So with that information, we can compute the sinuosity. And what does the sinuosity mean? So if the reach is perfectly straight, then the sinuosity will be one. If it's higher, the higher the sinuosity value, the more the reach meanders and deviates from a straight path which makes sense, right? This should help us identify those reaches where water is going to take a long time to travel through that reach segment versus those where water is going to um, move right through it. 
can the sinuosity be less than one? I'm guessing not. Um, so one means it's a perfectly straight line. And then as you get greater than one, the reach becomes more sinuous. Did that answer your question, Eric? So the more sinuous the stream, the longer it's going to take for water to tra um, travel through that stream segment. So I think of it as more of a just general information. If you have a regression equation that you use to help estimate the lag time for the reach, then you could use the sinuosity measure to help you develop that regression equation. 